Pesner, Stefan Koburov, Onza Katowil and Ignaz Rutter. Um, thankfully, we already got an introduction to linear layouts from Sergey, but uh, let's briefly recap uh, the two probably most popular ones, the stack layouts and the queue layouts. So in every linear layout, we want to find a linear order on the vertices, and we want to draw the, those vertices in this order on a horizontal line that we call the spine. And they are always defined by some forbidden subconfiguration. So corresponding to this linear order, we are not allowed to have any two edges that cross, then we have a stack layout. So our forbidden configuration looks like this, we have two crossing edges. In Q layouts, it's similar, but our forbidden configuration is not a crossing, but instead a nesting. We cannot have two edges like this that nest, and then we might get a layout that looks like this. So the stack layouts are more popular by now as book embeddings, but actually the name comes from the data structure stack because this encodes the way that we can add and remove uh, items from a data structure. So imagine every edge as a data point and every vertex corresponds to some time spot. And at every point in time, we can add something to the stack and we can remove something. So if we have an outgoing edge that goes to the right, then we push the item to the stack. And if we have an incoming edge, then we pull it from the stack. Let's look at it for this example. In the beginning, we start with edge one, we push it onto the stack, we push number two, and now we pull both of them from the stack. We push number three, push number four, push number five. And now here we have to pull number five and four. We have to push number six and pull three and six. So this corresponds to some order that we put items onto a stack and remove them again. And of course, we can do the same for the queues. Here, these are the N queue and D queue operations. So here we now add something at the top and remove at the bottom. Let's do it again for this example. We start with the one, we add it, we start, take the two, we add it, and now we remove number one from the bottom. So it leaves the queue here but we add number three, we add number four. Now we can remove number two from the bottom and now the other two. There are many questions that we can ask about these kind of layouts. The, the most natural probably is, can we characterize and can we recognize graphs that have these layouts? And this has been long solved. For stack layouts, it's exactly the outer planar graphs. And for Q layouts, as shown by Heath and Rosenberg, it's a so-called arced level planar graph. So I will not go into this in detail here, but the recognition for outer planar graphs is obviously in linear time, but down here, that's MB hard. Another direction you can look at is what Sergey also told us, that uh, we look at the number of uh, these pages that we have. So you can imagine you give your edges colors and now only between edges of the same color, you're not allowed to have those forbidden configurations. And then the question is how many colors do you need? And that's called pages. But we will stick with one page. We only want to look at layouts on one page. Now, of course, these are not the only data structures that exist. So we can define these layouts for any kind of data structure that you want. For example, we can look at double-ended queues. So now we can add at the top or the bottom and we can remove at the top or the bottom. And then we can get layouts like this. Here we actually have a crossing, so it's not a stack layout and we have a nesting, so it's not a queue layout, but it's a DQ layout. And we can just uh, verify this. We try to put everything on the DQ, start with the one, put it somewhere, put the two at the bottom, now remove the one again, put the three at the top, put the five at the top. And now at this point, we have to remove the two and the five. And uh, this would be a problem in the stack and in the queue, but now we can do it because one is at the bottom, top and the other one is at the bottom and everything is fine. We have the six and remove everything in the end. So here we have a DQ layout. And here actually the forbidden substructures are also known because Pratt in 73, that's before even uh, stack layouts were defined and queue layouts were defined, looked at uh, permutations that can occur in double-ended queues. And uh, he found some forbidden um, permutations and those can be translated. And that gives us two infinite families of forbidden substructures. The first one is we have a crossing and we have a third edge that crosses both those edges. 
or a path of length three or a path of length five or seven or any odd length path. And the second one is we have a nesting and we have a path of length two that crosses the middle one or of length four or length six or any even length. And if you have any of these forbidden substructures, then it's not a DQ layout. And those have also been characterized by our et al. Those are exactly the planar subhamiltonian graphs. But here, subhamiltonian means that they have uh, a Hamilton, they are the subgraph of a planar graph with a Hamilton path, not cycle. If you have a uh, Hamilton cycle, then you get uh, two stack layouts. But, oh, it's almost the same. And those are MP hard to recognize. So we want to look at something similar, but not quite the same. We take a different data structure, the so-called restricted input queues. Now we remove one freedom we cannot add at the bottom anymore. We always had to add at the top, but we can remove on both sides. And actually the same layout is also a so-called recue layout. And if we try to verify this, now it becomes much easier because we never have any choice. We always have to throw everything on it at the top and at any point in time, we just have to figure out, can we remove this edge from the top or bottom or not? We have the three here, we have the five. Again, we can remove the two and the five from the top and bottom. So this works out here. And for this, we found a much simpler forbidden configuration than for the DQ layouts, which looks like this. So actually it's kind of two different forbidden configurations. But for these two edges, it does not matter in which order they end. So we draw it like that. And to see that you cannot do that in a RQ layout is actually quite simple. So let's give the numbers and let's try to put everything on the RQ. We are at one, two, three. We have no choice so far, but now we have to remove number two, but it's stuck in the middle. So we cannot do that. So this is obviously not a RQ layout. And for the other direction, uh, the argumentation is quite similar. So let's say it does not have a RQ layout. So there must be some edge that we cannot remove. So something that's stuck here. Why can we not remove it? Well, there has to be something below it. Whatever is below has to be added earlier. So it starts here, but it's still there. So it hasn't been removed. So it extends to the right. And we cannot remove it from the top. So there has to be something above that must have been added later. And it's still there, so it extends to the right. And then we get exactly this forbidden configuration again. So our first attempt to get a characterization is exactly via this forbidden configuration. And we can say we have a RICU layout for a graph if and only if there is some linear order that avoids this pattern. Now well, this is nice, but this doesn't lead us really to an algorithm because we still have to test all linear orders and that's way too much to do it efficiently. So we want to find some other way to characterize those graphs. So let's review our uh, definitions again. We call a graph Hamiltonian if it has a Hamilton path. So a path that visits all the vertices exactly once. We will always draw this in brown from now on. And we call it, yeah, if it's a planar graph, then we can also, of course, do this. And here we only consider planar graphs now. We call it sub Hamiltonian if we can adjust to it such that it remains planar but becomes Hamiltonian. So this is a sub Hamiltonian planar graph because we can add these two edges here, then we have a Hamiltonian one. This is not enough for Riku layouts. We have to restrict things a bit more and we are look at one-sided subhamiltonian graphs. So those are subhamiltonian, but they also have an embedding where all the edges start on the same side of the Hamilton path. And for start, they have to be directed. So we just direct all the edges from left to right along this path. Well, let's look at this layout here. This is not one-sided subhamiltonian because these two vertices here, they have an edge that starts on the left or at the top side and one that starts at the bottom. But the graph actually is one-sided subhamiltonian. This is not so hard to fix. We can just take these two edges and flip them to the other side. And now if we look at the left vertex, everything starts at the top here, everything starts at the bottom. So this is okay. 
there's still this vertex. It has two edges on different sides, but that's fine because they end in this vertex. They don't start there. So this is still allowed. And this is a one-sided subhamiltonian layout. But this is also not enough for RIQ layouts. We have to restrict it even more. We have to look at strongly one-sided subhamiltonian Hamiltonian layouts. And here we globally require all edges to start on the same side. So either every edge starts at the top or every edge starts at the bottom. So if we look at this layout again, yeah, of course it's not correct, but we can flip these two edges to the top. And now everything starts at the top. Everything is fine. Well, except that it's not planar. But is it still strongly one sided sub Hamiltonian? Maybe somebody can see a way to fix this. Yep. Right. There's nothing that tells us we have to draw everything on the same side. We can just take this edge and we wrap it around and now we enter from the bottom. We have a planar layout and this is strongly one-sided sub -hamilton. And now we're there. This type of layouts, that's exactly the RICU layout. So we have a RICU layout if and only if the graph is strongly one sided sub -hamilton. And uh, this is not so hard to prove, so we, we can quickly sketch it uh, at least here. Uh, for the first direction, let's say we don't have a RICU layout. We want to show that it's not strongly one sided sub -hamiltonian. If it's not a RICU layout, that means that we somewhere have this forbidden configuration. And now let's try to put this forbidden configuration somewhere on a strongly one-sided sub Hamiltonian layout. Let's start with the edge number two. It has to start at the top. It can also enter at the top, but now the edge that starts in number three, it cannot leave the space. So we always get a crossing here. And if we enter from the bottom, it's similar. Now we look at the edge that starts in one. It has to end somewhere and it has to end somewhere on the spine here. So it goes somewhere like this. And then no matter how way we route it at the top or at the bottom, we will always get a crossing. So this does not work. And for the other direction, we need to find a way to get such a strongly one-sided sub Hamiltonian path or an embedding that has this from a RICU layout. For that, let's look again at the way we would put this into the data structure. We start here, we take the edges number one and two, we put them here. We take the edges number three and four, we put them here. And at this point, we have to remove something. First, we have to remove this blue edge. And it enters from the top. And actually in the data structure, the four is also at the top, it's at the head. We remove it from the head. So we call it a head edge. And then we have this other edge that enters at the bottom. And actually in the auricula, um, it's also at the bottom, it's at the tail. So we call it a tail edge. <clears throat> and this is a head edge again. And for number two, actually it can be both. We can also wrap it around, it doesn't matter, but let's just also call it a head edge. And now to get such a layout, we need some linear order. That's quite easy. Um, the Hamiltonian path is just the linear order that we get from the Riku layout. And we need to find an embedding. And for that embedding, we just look at a single vertex. And for each of those, we can define in which order we see the edges around it. And that's first all the outgoing head edges from left to right, then the outgoing tail edges from right to left, then the incoming head edges from left to right, then the incoming Hamilton path edge and the incoming tail edges. And if we do this for every vertex, then we get a rotation system and that gives us an embedding if the whole thing is planar. So we only have to show that it actually is planar. And for that, let's assume we have a crossing. This can be between two head edges. But now look at these two. Uh, look at them in the requeue. We add number one, we add number two, and now we have to remove one from the head. That does not work because two is in the way. So this cannot happen. The left one can be a tail edge, but then we don't even have a crossing. This is fine. The right one can be a tail edge. But that's exactly the same argument. At the one, at the two, we cannot remove the one at the head. Or both can be tail edges. And then again, we add the one, we add the two, 
but now we have to remove the two at the bottom that also does not work. So there cannot be any crossing. That means that this is planar and it's obviously one sided sub Hamiltonian. So we have the characterization. <clears throat> now we have something nicer, but now we have to recognize those graphs. And we did not completely solve it, but we are getting there. So I will show you the proof for a very kind of restricted case. So if you give me the embedding and you don't ask me for a sub Hamiltonian graph, but just a Hamiltonian graph, then we can decide it in quadratic time. And that is a one step algorithm. <laughs> it's step one, guess the first edge on the Hamilton path. That's it. Because now if we look at the, the situation, let's say we have guessed so far the Hamilton path, we have some vertex here and we want to find the next edge on the Hamilton path. Well, we know everything about these edges here and we know the embedding. So it has to counterclockwise follow the orange edge here. It has to be this edge, there's no choice. We have to pick this one. So as soon as we have guessed the first edge, everything else just follows. So we just try all the edges Let's look at it as an example and try to figure out if everything works out. We start here, we take the next one counterclockwise. This is an incoming edge. We take the next one, take the next one, takes the next one. We're stuck. This did not work. Take another one. We start here, take the next one. This is incoming, take the next. This is incoming, take the next, take the next. And we never have a choice. But at this point, we reach the last vertex. And now we found a Hamilton path, and all the edges start on the left side of it. If you don't give me in the embedding, then we can still solve this question for Hamiltonian, not for sub Hamiltonian. But we need some more time. Now we have n to the four time. And I will not show you the proof here, but the idea is that we do a dynamic program on SPQ Artery. And for all the different components, we have to analyze how can they look like, and uh, then we save which ways can we traverse them. So let's summarize. We introduced the RICU layouts. We found their forbidden configurations. We have a characterization for those graphs that admit such a layout. And for the recognition for two special cases when we only want Hamiltonian, then we can solve it in a polynomial time. But the question for sub Hamiltonian is still open. We have some idea of where we think it works, but there are still many details we have to work out. And of course, you can ask many other questions like what is the RIG number of planar graphs? So how many colors for the edges do we need so that we can do it? Or your favorite subclass of planar graphs or your favorite class of graphs. And you can ask, what is the RIG number of complete graphs, for example? Here we have some lower and upper bounds. So it's somewhere between 0 0.29 to 9n and 0 0.333. But we don't know the exact number. And for complete bipartite graphs, we actually don't really know anything. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>